Good morning and good day to you all. Uh, welcome to the webinar series on next generation trade facilitation. My name is Sue. I am from United Nations ESCAP and I am pleased to um, open and also moderate the session one on agricultural trade facilitation. Uh, before we start, I just want to give you a little, um, a few uh, house uh, rules. Please mute yourself um, when you are not speaking, including the panelists, so that we have a smooth flow. We have the um, chat function. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat box and we will pick it up at the end of the panel discussions in the Q&As. If we do not have the time, we will liaise with the panelists and then provide you answers afterwards through the email. And uh, we also have evaluation form. If you can fill it in, that would be great for us to accommodate better and enhance um, future events. So with this, without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Yan Duval, Chief of Trade Policy and Facilitation Section of ESCAP. Yan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. I hope you can uh, all hear me and see me. Um, very good afternoon uh, to all of you from Bangkok. Uh, very warm welcome to this webinar series on next generation trade facilitation. So this is organized by ESCAP uh, uh, together with the other four uh, United Nations Regional Commissions. So let me maybe give you a brief background on, on the series. Uh, so it really builds on the joint work uh, of the UN Regional Commissions uh, on the UN Global Survey on Digital and Sustainable Trade Facilitation, uh, which we have been uh, conducting together uh, since 2015. So I hope you are all uh, familiar with the survey and you're all aware that we collected new data this year. Uh, we released the 2021 data set for about 140, I think 143 countries a few months ago. <clears throat> so the survey provides an overall picture of the state of play uh, in terms of the implementation of over 50 trade facilitation measures. Uh, one specific characteristic of the global survey uh, is that it goes well beyond the list of measures in the WTO trade facilitation agreement. Uh, it covers uh, a more advanced digital and paperless trade facilitation measures, as well as uh, measures that we call sustainable uh, trade facilitation measures. That is measures targeted at groups uh, or sectors with uh, special needs, such as SMEs, women, agriculture sector, and so on. Uh, because most of the digital and sustainable trade facilitation measures go beyond the basic set of uh, measures in the TFA, uh, we call them these uh, these measures uh, next generation uh, trade facilitation measures. So that's the secret behind the the title of this webinar series. Uh, we have uh, very good information on digital and paperless trade facilitation measures uh, and related good practices, uh, including because, uh, as you know, UN regional commissions have historically been very active in this area. I mean, UNEC also UN CFAC, uh, and, and ESCAP is also the secretariat for the UN Treaty on Cross-Border uh, Paperless Trade Facilitation in Asia and the Pacific, uh, as well as uh, of the UN Network of Experts uh, for Paperless Trade and Transport uh, in the region. Uh, we also actually have a separate webinar series with the International Chamber of Commerce and ADB on accelerating cross-border paperless trade uh, that provides uh, in-depth uh, information to us and all interested participants in this area. So in contrast to this, uh, we have really limited information and good practices uh, on, on sustainable uh, trade facilitation. So the 2021 survey uh, shows that implementation of, the, uh, of these measures are often lower than, than other types uh, of measures. So what uh, we really hope to get out of this webinar uh, webinar series uh, is, is really um, uh, more attention uh, being put on, on those sustainable trade facilitation measures, and as well as uh, uh, identification of concrete uh, implementation practices uh, in these areas. So accordingly, we'll have three uh, webinars today uh, in a row, right? The first one, um, will be on agriculture, so each of them focused on a different group of sustainable next generation trade facilitation measures. So agriculture is the, the one now, the next one will be on uh, trade facilitation measures for SMEs, and the last one, but not the least, uh, will be on trade facilitation measures for women. So very special thanks to our colleagues for 
uh, from ECA, from Africa, uh, for a leading organization of this, of this last webinar. Uh, so we really have great panels of, of experts for all webinars, in fact, long lists. And so let me stop right here uh, with a very big thank, uh, thank you to all of them uh, and the organization for joining and spending the time uh, to share good practices with us. So thank you again, and uh, so you, you can take it forward. Thank you very much. So uh, with this, uh, I will give a very brief introduction to the agricultural trade facilitation. Let me bring up my um, presentation. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, before introducing all the distinguished panelists, I just want to set the scene. Uh, starting with the, um, the importance of the trade facilitation for agriculture. Because the speedy movement of trading goods is crucial for agricultural products, especially perishable ones. So it's a very important uh, topic for. And then agriculture sector represents a big proportion of small scale uh, traders and SMEs. So it does have a big impact for the sustainable um, development, as Jan mentioned. Uh, in addition, we can't, cannot say anything uh, besides uh, mentioning about the COVID-19 pandemic. It has really prompted many countries to take various measures to protect their um, protect their crisis by uh, introducing some limitations and restrictions for the import and export bans on certain agriculture products. But I think it's really timely for us to discuss about the agriculture trade facilitation in this uh, pandemic era as well. Um, with that, uh, we would. Um, as Jan has mentioned, uh, we have uh, surveyed um, in more than 140 countries in 2021 uh, with the sustainable uh, with the uh, agriculture trade facilitation measures under the sustainable group. So, if you look at the implementation rates of the uh, agriculture trade facilitation compared with other Um, other trade facilitation measures, it is actually quite um, high. Um, it has relatively high implementation rates compared to other sustainable TF measures. However, if you look at the um, implementation rates by subregions, um, it does vary from subregion to subregions. So, for example, Pacific as well as Sub-Saharan uh, Africa has very low implementation rates compared to other developed and developing countries. It is also true if you look at the implementation rates by individual measures for the next uh, presentation slide, which is showing for the special. This is your So you are muted. Yeah, sorry. I was muted by someone. But um, can you all see the slides? For the. Yes, we can see yes, them. It's not full screen, okay. but we can see. OK, thank you. So for, um, for the um, implementation rates by individual measures. Which is the la next slide. Jungman. So for the special treatment of perishable goods, more than 80% of countries has uh, implemented it, at least on pilot basis. But this is partly because uh, it is a core um, requirement for the WTO TFA. It is also um, has higher implementation rate, relatively higher implementation rates for the measures related to the SPS. Um, however, the last one, when we look at the electronic application and issuance of S SPS certificates, it has very low implementation rates with only about 10% of fully implemented in countries. Uh, we noted from this uh, 2021 survey results, as well as 
some of the readiness assessment for cross-border paperless trade studies that was conducted in Asia and the Pacific, um, it is shown that the regulatory agencies, other than customs, which is dealing with the SBA standards and testing, they are not really equipped with the um, paperless systems or automated systems. So that is really highlighting the importance, but also the lack of uh, paperless trade systems in the area of agricultural trade facilitation. So with this, um, I would be, without further ado, would like to open up the uh, panel discussion session. So I would like to introduce the panel panelists. So starting with Ms. John Lei Ma, Senior Analyst of Agricultural Trade Promotion Center of Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs of China. Then we have Mr. Connor Movie Hill, um, who is the Director of Dairy Industry Island. And Mr. Craig Bradshaw, uh, International Plant Protection Convention, IPPC Secretariat, followed by Dr. Homer Jin, Eng Sengimana, Secretary General of African Organization for Standardization. Then Mr. Steve Coppel, expert of UNCPAC. Last but not least, Mr. Cesare Varallo, founder of FootlawLatest.com. So as you can see, we've got very distinguished panelists with us. And because of the time, um, I would like to uh, straight go into and introducing Ms. Ma um, for her intervention. She is with us here, but she has uh, shared the pre-recording of her intervention, but she will be ready to answer any of the questions after the, after the presentation. Thanks, bear with us. We we don't have sound, uh, Jung Jung Yuan. I think so. You're the one sharing. You're on mute as well, right? Sorry, Zhang Yuan, but we don't have the sound yet. So I would like to move um, to Mr. Connor Murphy here first, and then we will come back to Ms. Ma. Uh, Connor, if you don't mind. Okay, no problem. And, and thanks very much for, for having me. Absolutely delighted to, to meet you all there this morning. Um, I suppose the first thing to say, I'm not a trade expert. I'm a head of a trade association. So I guess what I... I'm going to try to do is is give maybe give a case study of a small country um on the west of Europe on the Atlantic and uh just see how we maybe dealt with the challenges that we've all been suffering for the last two years and and maybe to build back better. So for those of you who don't know where Ireland is, it's a small country on the west of Europe, there uh just off uh the UK and continental Europe. Um, we're a small country of 5 million people, but we would be regarded as a developed country in the classical sense, but we are very dependent on agriculture still. We never industrialized and we're we have a very strange kind of makeup with tech and pharmaceuticals. And then the other side is, is 
is bovine products and I'm the head of the dairy association here, but we also have a big meat industry and even though we're a country of only 5 million people, we produce enough food for 50 million people. So trade facilitation for our 130,000 farms, which are all SMEs and 18,000 dairy farms is absolutely fundamental to what we do. We do not exist without functioning trade facilitation. So um, our farms are Ireland for any of you who are there is a very wet and and kind of mild country. And one of the upshots of having that climate is we have a lot of rain and a lot of grass. So that picture there is is typical of a, of a farm in Ireland, multi generational, three generations, a grandfather, a mother and a son. They're the Boyle family just to personalize them. And, and that's their herd of dairy cows in the west of Ireland. And that is typical of SMEs. It's typical of like there's a lot of talk about sustainability and there's different legs of the sustainability stool. There's integrating women in our in our businesses. There's integrating environmental footprint. There's integrating social elements and economic elements. And without trade facilitation and without the easements of trade facilitation, none of that works. So I think it's a, it might be a good example for us. And there's a key number I just want to talk to the audience. 95% it's a huge number there. And what it means is for every 100 litres of milk that farm, as we speak now, it's it's early in the morning in Ireland and that those farmers are out milking cows at the moment. For every 100 litres they produce, 95 have to leave our island for markets elsewhere in the world. So from our perspective, that is absolutely key and those litres of milk go into different dairy products but need to get off our island around the world. Um, so those farmers, they don't know themselves how important trade facilitations are and that's where trade associations like us come in to work with the cooperative companies and, and in, in Ireland the farmers own the, the, the dairy co-ops um, so they're part of that SME integrated system. And uh, I've just gone to the last slide to maybe just go through those issues um, around trade facilitation. So best practice is key. And I guess from our perspective, as, as difficult as COVID has been and other challenges like climate change, like Brexit, some of you who know what's happening in Europe, the, our neighbours from Ireland, the UK have left the European Union, so they've left our trading association. So we're an island off an island with our neighbours after leaving our trade system. So huge challenges for us as a sector. And I keep saying it, we're dependent on multilateralism and cooperation. So how do we address those issues? And I suppose they were just put up there and in, 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 in both the chairman's comments and your comments, Sue, and the, 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 I think the survey you have done captured it perfectly in terms of what we're looking at. Dairies perishable. So we have worked very hard with the national authorities in Ireland, with the EU in terms of our trading block to ensure that there's special facilitations for perishable goods. Green lane products, uh, uh, the green lane system was brought in um, in the pandemic and that has served us very, very well. In Europe and in Ireland, we had very clunky um, um, certification. It was done by paper and crazy in, in this day and age when we can sit here and do uh, a, a call. So there's been huge uh, uh, push forward to the implementation of electronic certification which has helped us enormously. And finally, labs. Ireland has an excellent reputation for food safety and for exporting everything like that. You really need to have that really uh, perfect. You cannot afford any mistakes for food safety. So we have a lot of lab facilities to, to hit targets and to hit uh, the SPS requirements of different partners. And they are both a company at academic level in Ireland and at national level, our state has state laboratories. So we, we look to improve those uh, lab facilities and integrate with our gov governmental departments. From a DII perspective, Dairy Industry Ireland as a trade association, what do we do? We try to be an interlocutor for our companies and our farmers with our Department of Agriculture, Culture Department of Enterprise, 
use of our foreign affairs, international embassy networks regarding standards to ensure that we're complying with COVID standards, etc. Um, we look at standard uh, standards. Um, we have our own national standard bodies like Board B, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland and Enterprise Ireland that gives us help with innovation. And I suppose the international element is key, which is where a lot of this audience is today. So at EU level, we work with the European Commission and peer European trade associations for learnings about trade facilitation that we can bring back to Ireland. And obviously then the international element, the UN have been key, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, looking at standards during the Codex Networks looking at guidance about you know even can COVID move on packaging of dairy products the WHO are enormously helpful in terms of giving us guidance there and giving 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 our, our trade system a good um a good boost so I think that's maybe might set the scene chairman and and Miss Wu and maybe I, I'll stop it there and I'm happy to take any questions Thank you very much, Mr. Mulvey. That was very interesting. Like it is a, a very unique uh, circumstances in Ireland and you have captured it well. So let me move to Mr. Craig Beckhoff. Um, he is from the International Plant Protection Convention, IPP Secretariat. And as you well know, um, a, a, a huge player and a important uh, body for the SPS related. So Craig, it's the floor is yours and Anissa will be sharing the screen. For your presentation. Okay, great. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Um, yeah, the 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 first page here is uh, not obviously the title, but the the map is showing the current uh, status as of yesterday of the e phyto solution, and uh, the the darker green countries or the the darker countries, depending, um, are those that are actually using it as a part of a daily routine part of daily business exchanging with other countries the lighter green color the olive green is our countries that are currently testing and then the orange countries are are, are countries that have registered but have not quite begun testing or in different statuses and if you could go to the next page please so um as I noted on, on the map, there are 104 countries registered right now, and 60 countries are using the eFIDO solution on a daily basis, uh, paperless trade. A lot of countries now are engaging in paperless trade, including some, some of the key ones, uh, Argentina and Chile uh, were, were the first actually to uh, start trading uh, phytosanitary certificates, electronic phytosanitary certificates. And, and, and when we talk about eFIDO, what we're talking about is an it's it's basically short for an electronic phytosanitary certificate and it's just a digitized phytosanitary certificate but it also meets the requirements of the ISPM or the international standard for phytosanitary measures uh, number 12 for phytosanitary certificates and annex one particularly focuses on digitalization of these phytosanitary certificates and the eFIDO um, helps comply with Article 7.9 and 10.1 of the Trade Facilitation Agreement of the WTO. So it's right in there as a facilitator for trade facilitation. And any country that gets on the system can begin exchanging a phytosanitary certificate with any other country. Um, a lot of times they like to pilot with one or two of the um, senior countries, I guess, countries that have been on the system a little bit longer just to make sure everything's working okay. And um, this eliminates the need for one country to bilaterally negotiate with another to establish a relationship to exchange phytosanitary certificates digitally. And we don't charge anybody for using the system. It's free to access. Um, we provide training and um, we're happy uh, with some of our uh, partners that we work with to facilitate um, countries coming on board, uh, getting trained, things of that nature. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Next slide, please. This is really what the system, you know, in a, in a pictorial sense can look like. We have 
a central e phyto hub and that's the the main uh, object in the middle and the connections go from countries with their own national systems or countries that use a web-based generic e phyto national system we call it a gens and and they can access to it the countries with national systems uh, go directly to the e phyto hub the gens countries they use a web-based approach and that goes through the web and goes to the e phyto hub a couple of key points related to this is that we at the ippc we do not retain any data we simply facilitate the exchange of the data from country to country and ppo national plant protection organization to another and really this takes place in a matter of seconds next slide please so some of the benefits reported um, and i'll go through these but but the way we got to these benefits how did we get to the benefits um, that have been reported and and in many cases, in fact, in almost all cases, countries usually did an analysis of their business processes to figure out the best approaches to take, how to develop this, how to get buy-in from senior governmental staff, how to get buy-in from industry, and how to work to build this up. And right now, on our main webpage, which is www.efitoexchange.org, we have 10 countries, and they're listed here, Fiji, Argentina. Argentina, Sri Lanka, Costa Rica, Uganda, Uzbekistan, New Zealand, USA, Jamaica, and the Republic of Korea have provided detailed case studies with a lot of information about their processes, how they set up to go about coming on board the e FIDO system. And as a result of coming on board, we've seen some of the following specific benefits that have been reported. Um, across the board, there's an average of about four days of time saved in the trade process. Uh, the next one's kind of interesting, and I, I hope the express courier service companies don't uh, get too upset with us, but they're not being used as much. Um, probably anywhere from between fifty to a hundred dollars U.S. dollars per shipment have been saved because there's no need to ship the paper certificates from one corporate entity to another corporate entity and starting out with the national plant protection organization which would issue the e-fido gives it to the industry the industry is responsible for getting it to the importing country who then is responsible for giving it to customs and the importing national plant protection organization that process has been bypassed and now the national plant protection organization in the exporting country simply sends in a matter of seconds the electronic phytosanitary certificate to the importing national plant protection organization so there's a an incredible cost savings there and in one case in fiji they've said that they've saved up to nine hundred thousand dollars per year um, in in many respects just from the number of personnel required a lot of personnel savings and things of that nature and yet it only cost them about uh, less than $500,000 to set up the system. And they're using the GEN system right now. And a lot, lot of that involved getting uh, 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 equipment and, and training more than anything else. There's also been a reflected reduction in the cost of labor for exporters. Uh, things can be done online. They uh, save gas. They don't have to go to an office. And it's also been a benefit um, in the context of the pandemic and that there's less face-to-face -face time. So people aren't necessarily interacting face-to-face. -face. They can do a lot of things online. There's no need for special security paper. Uh, there are cost savings in, in some cases of up to 200,000 US dollars because you don't have to buy special paper for protection. Uh, fraud is significantly reduced, in fact, Uganda noted that uh, they have almost zero fraud at this point. Uh, Jamaica's also said that. Um, effective use of resources at border stations. Um, there's a, the advance notice, so uh, arrangements can be made for um, personnel to, uh, to 
be prepared to inspect and what to inspect uh, land borders. There have been reductions in queues reported by Uzbekistan that the trucks waiting at the border have the, the lines have been significantly reduced. In some cases, uh, as I mentioned, Uganda noticed that zero fraudulent certificates, a huge, huge, huge issue, not just for financial terms, but also the risks of pests that could come across with these uh, uninspected uh, shipments, uh, which helps protect the health of plants. And that's a key point. And a lot of countries have saved money joining the eFIDO hub by uh, using trade facilitation project funding to cover the eFIDO accession costs. And we've also, as I mentioned in, uh, earlier, we've also partnered with the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, which is part of the World Economic Forum, or actually it's, it's, it's uh, maintained at the World Economic Forum. And they have started a lot of projects in various countries to get eFIDO, particularly the GENs, but in some cases national systems, up and running in those countries. And finally, it's also facilitated the collection of reliable trade statistics because countries, we don't get the trade statistics, but individual countries have data digitally, electronically, and it helps for report writing and helping them to make significant decisions. Next slide, please. So some specific benefits, and I, I, I'm sorry that they're all primarily Western Hemisphere related, but um, these are some specific instances where eFIDO has, has, has made a significant impact. Um, one is a U.S. grain shipment to Chile had a, a eFIDO with some typographical errors, and um, because Chile accepted is part of the eFIDO system, they accepted a corrected eFIDO literally within a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, the company uh, saved $36,000 in demerge charges. And so the shipment in question was released in a matter of hours rather than what could have been several days. Same thing with Argentina pomegranate fruits uh, going to the US. Uh, corrected eFIDO uh, was issued and a perishable shipment uh, was released again within hours rather than days and the shelf life of the pomegranate fruit was maintained. And then another recent incident a couple months ago was a fraudulent shipment from the US to Mexico where the paper certificate was a fraud and because both countries are using the eFIDO system there was no correlation to any of the numbers in either country's system. And so the shipment was halted at the border and a possible pest problem, as I mentioned before, that could have affected the health of plants in, in Mexico was averted. So these are some specific examples of how the eFIDO um, solution, the IPPC <laughs> eFIDO solution has really helped countries to improve and uh, facilitate an efficient and safe trade in plants and plant products. Uh, the, only, the only thing I would mention is that the system was built to handle 100,000 eFIDOs or electronic certificates per day. We're currently with, with 60 countries using the system at roughly around 110,000 eFIDOs per month. There's a lot of room for growth and we built it that way because we want to make sure that it doesn't have to be eFIDO. It could be ESPS. And we would be happy to explore with our food safety and veterinary service organizations uh, the opportunity for them to exchange their certificates digitally through the system as well. So with that, you can go to the next slide. And I'm happy to say thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you today about the eFIDO solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig, for, in, um, for the, uh, sharing the good practices. Uh, indeed, um, um, Chile, Argentina, and Mexico, and as well as uh, other countries, uh, you have shared about the good practices which resulted in 
um, not only in uh, reducing of the uh, cost in terms of the careers or, or document related, but also the fraud, fraud, fraud prevention, which is quite uh, critical. So with that, uh, let me go back to Ms. Ma. Apologies for the um, interruptions, but um, Anissa, if you can um, now share the video uh, from Ms. Ma, please. Anissa, we don't have the sound. Uh, apologies, everyone, but yeah, I think we are still having the technical problem. Uh, um, it was been fine, but anyways, I am very sorry about it. Uh, so let me uh, move on and get back to Ms. Ma. I'm, I'm very sorry about it. So I would like to introduce Dr. Hermo Jin and Sengimana, Secretary General of African Organization for Standardization. Hermo Jin, it's your Thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to share the experience on trade facilitation in agriculture. Um, it, 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 you know, first of all, also is an intergovernment organization of the African Union, and we are in charge of uh, harmonizing and developing standards and harmonizing conformity assessment. That's why I will concentrate more on the two key issues uh, you talked about on uh, standard issues and uh, testing facility. Uh, looking at the quality infrastructure, uh, that's what worked for us at the continent is um, a, to, to harmonize the standard uh, looking at the priority sector. Uh, that's led now to technical regulation that can be equivalent in different countries. Uh, this more help um, the SMEs, the industry, to conform to the requirements of the other countries because you are using the same standards and uh, it's easier to have the equivalence on technical regulation. But the standard also uh, touches on the competition. It, since 2014, uh, we conducted uh, stock taking to check the levels of um, uh, the countries on TBT issues and the SPS issues. Uh, on SPS, we, we, some countries uh, don't have data to, to, to share that that was one of the, the key issues found out. But when we started this work, on mapping the countries, looking at the status of their quality infrastructure, it's really helped uh, for policymakers because the policymakers don't, don't want more, more wording and so on. When they look directly to the map, if you look at to the, the left map on stock taking, this uh, take care of the standard bodies, the metrology, 
issues, the accreditation and the conformity assessment and market surveys. It means that all together we put indicators that can show the country it's like a traffic light. If you are green, you are on good status. If you are yellow, you are in the middle. And if you are red, you need to do more on your quality infrastructure. Similar part to the SPS, you look at, do you have SPS committees? Uh, do you utilize the risk assessment? Uh, do, do you have early warning system? This really helped when we, we, we give this information, our publication to the policymakers, they understand easier how what to do at the national level to improve their system. Uh, the other part which is very key that we saw was helping is not just to look at the standard on quality issues and uh, SPS measures, but we found out that even on the financial part, uh, why you want to help the agriculture sector and the other sector, uh, there is a need to have good financial grant practice. That's when we, we published this standard. Actually, the standard is one of the African regional standard that is even being utilized in Southern America, in, the, in America, in a way. Sorry. Uh, do you see my slide? Yes. 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 Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The, this standard really helped a lot yeah, for the, the, the financial part for our SMEs uh, while they are dealing with the, their business. Uh, on uh, another uh, good lesson we learned is uh, what we call maturity model. It is to see how the, our SMEs, our business, our small and medium enterprises can enter the value chain. We created a conformity assessment system which helps a, a, an SME from the struggle level to become a world class by entering the value chain. Then what, how, what do we do? We look at the local market. Are they trading at local, at national, at regional or global? Then you have a certification, a certification that has all the, the, the levels, they have similar indicators, like the, in this case on no, the, the agriculture part, we have these indicators, but at different levels from pre-required, critical, required, general, optional. Then when, when you look at the report from market on no, different issues on trade facilitation, we found out this was cost effective, uh, easy to enter the value chain. It was adapted to a government priorities because it's market targeted and you can be easily uh, benchmark with other certification schemes and help the SMEs to enter the market. Uh, if they are specific. We have like on the case of aquaculture, we have the tilapia, and uh, we, we, we found out the, the companies that are now certified are e e easily entering the bigger value chain, the bigger global value chain. They are even gaining the market at na national level. Uh, the other reason I want to share with you is that we all know these standard and uh, SPS measures, they are very technical. They are very technical what we do now we take a standard, an ARISO standard, we develop what we call outreach materials. These outreach materials have been very, very successful because countries are able even to translate in their local languages that they are, now the farmers can implement easily a certain standard in different areas. Um, the other important um, key issues that uh, we, we, we deal with is the information sharing. We have a trade, Africa trade web portal that we can share information. What do we do? A country, each country has a, a, an officer uh, that is in charge of entering the information on their export and imports, 
the requirements that they have? Uh, do you have technical regulation related to that? Do you have other environmental issues related to that? This helps also countries now to start a discussion on mutual recognition, because when you see that these requirements are different from my requirement, it's easier now to start the discussion. Uh, lastly, uh, one key part that I found out, uh, we found out that is missing always is gender mainstreaming, because we tend to, to not in the area of standardization and the quality infrastructure, we, te we tend not to. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yes, we can we, hear you. Yes, we tend we tend not to to use uh, to, 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 to take care of the gender in what we do as a technical people. It's very important that now we, we, we do it purposely targeted that we include gender issues in our uh, technical experts uh, in the, the, that are dealing with the standard work and uh, even on the education part, like essay competition that we, we, we continue to do at the African level. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hermoshin. That was very insightful. Um, uh, looking at the trip portals, as well as you touched upon the gender mainstream issues, which we will be dealing with it in the later session as well. So. Um, Thank you very much once again. So now, now I would like to move on to Mr. Steve Kappel. Uh, he's an expert from UNC FAC and he, um, um, hello Steve, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. <clears throat> okay, the floor is yours. Okay, can I share my screen? Of course. Okay. Do that. Can you see a, a slide that says ESERT SPS? Yeah, yes. if you can make a full slide, that would be better. Yeah, I'm just putting it into hopefully into full screen mode. Does that work? That's perfect. Thank you. OK, so um, I'm going to put my countdown timer on so I don't take more than 10 minutes. Start. There we go. Um, I'm here to just introduce everyone to the uh, UNC FAC standards around uh, certificates, uh, the specific case of SPS, but also some reuse of the same structure for um, um, uh, certificates of origin and potentially other certificates like CITES. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll get on with it. Um, a little bit of metrics. Um, you see here by country or by region, really, uh, uptake of UNECE uh, agricultural facilitation measures, uh, and that, that's more than uh, um, um, e-commerce stuff. It's uh, it's it's a, a variety of measures, but a reasonable uh, uh, uptake around the world, uh, averaging about sixty percent. That breaks down into these um, categories um, of um, of agricultural facilitation measures, and you can see here that um, some of the um, uh, treatments and lab testing and national standard stuff are a bit ahead of uh, some of the electronic data exchange stuff. And uh, so my presentation today is mostly about uh, that bottom um, uh, metric, which is the uptake of electronic application uh, and issuance of, of SPS certificates. Uh, so just quickly, the uh, UNC FACT uh, ESERT standard um, has been around for uh, nearly 20 years. It came out in 2004. It's in version 5.1 now. It's a fairly simple concept. It's basically based on an expectation that digital data is exchanged between governments. So an ESERT is sent from an exporting regulator to an importing regulator, and an acknowledgement comes back. Uh, there's details on the standards, and I've provided some links here for people that download this slide uh, show to uh, follow uh, for themselves. Uh, what I thought I might do is quickly go through the data model and demonstrate uh, basically the difference between the generic standard and some of its applications, such as the IPPC hub that you've just heard about. Uh, so on the left here is a detailed model that I, I won't go into, but lots of uh, 
fine grained properties, but uh, on the right is a, is a high level abstraction of that, that it really explains how the ESA model is structured. And basically at the top is a certificate uh, route that's got some sort of signatory uh, data, who, who issued it, who signed it. Uh, it's about a consignment, which has the usual consignee, consignor and transport information about it. And that consignment contains one or more trade items that has things like uh, harmonized tariff classifications and packaging information. And then we finally get down to this bit at the bottom, which is the really the quality claim or the uh, characteristic about that trade item that is really at the heart of the certificate. And in the UN model, that's very generic. It's just a characteristic. Uh, it can put anything in there, really. Uh, and that's kind of deliberate to make the abstract model reusable in multiple certification contexts. Um, so that bit there is what uh, needs to be detailed for it to be really usable in a particular context. So I, I, I'm going to refer to IPPC's use of the UN CFAC standard as an example of how that generic UN structure gets specialized and uh, refined uh, for a particular use case. Right. And again, there's a whole bunch of links there, very good documents on the uh, IPPC page uh, about, for example, how to take that general UN term characteristic about a good in a consignment and say, well, if we care about um, uh, EFITO, what we actually want to talk about here is things like treatment type, the chemical used, the duration of the treatment, the concentration and temperature and so on. So. Uh, uh, IPPC has specified a whole bunch of specializations around this characteristic and provided some standard code lists. So that's that's basically what you need to do uh, when you take a generic certificate type and use it in a particular context. Honestly, that, that IP, IPPC uh, specializations would apply equally whether you use the IPPC hub to transfer or whether you uh, continue with a G2G model. The, um, um, uh, the semantics are independent of how you exchange the thing. Uh, one thing we did recently is take exactly the same certificate model and say, well, could we use it for a different certificate type? That's actually not to do with agriculture, although sometimes agriculture does need origin data. Uh, it's We had a look at preferential certificates of origin. And the discovery was that uh, the same certificate uh, structure, not surprisingly, worked. We just had to change that characteristic to be less talking about plant health and more talking about um, origin criteria and preferential duty rates and so on. But for the rest, the certificate uh, worked unchanged. Uh, one thing that was a bit different, and this is quite interesting, I think, with regards to certificates of origin, was that the G2G model uh, didn't work too well. Uh, and that's because unlike phytosanitary certificates that are largely a G2G exchange, things like certificates of origin are used by other parties in the supply chain for different purposes, such as uh, trade finance by a financial institution. So clearly, if, if you've sent the certificate digitally from government A to government B, how do you show it to the bank? Uh, so with uh, the certificate of origin uh, um, uh, project, we kept the same data model, uh, but changed the uh, exchange mechanism to use a thing called uh, verifiable credentials. So basically that's making it digital, but giving it to the exporter to present to any party, including the importing regulator, but also financial institutions uh, for them to verify and extract data. So it uh, decouples the uh, direct G2G connection, but makes the uh, uh, the certificate accessible and verifiable to anyone in the supply chain. And uh, I had a bit quick think about CITES. CITES is in its very early stage. There is a collaborative effort between UNEC, UNSCAP, and ANTAD to think about how could we use this same um, uh, certificate structure for another domain, in this case, CITES. Uh, so not surprisingly, the same uh, generic structure should work, except, of course, that characteristic is now no longer about origin data or plant health. It's about species and quotas. Um, but with an appropriate vocabulary, the same structure should work. Uh, also, a bit like um, certificates of origin, CITES is far from a simple G2G um, uh, use case. Uh, it's, it's in fact quite complex. I won't go into all the details of this uh, slide, but in principle, there, there are export certificates, uh, sorry, export permits, import permits, re-export permits that must reference the original export permit. Uh, and uh, the whole supply chain is, uh, or um, verification structure is, is quite decentralized. So actually maps quite well, I think, uh, to 
the same uh, verifiable credential model, decentralized model. So no G2G exchange, no hub, just give the credential, verifiable credential to the uh, stakeholder in the supply chain uh, to present to whoever they need to present it to, to get the job done. Uh, that um, uh, operating model for exchange seems to work very well for a lot of cross-border permits and certificate types. Uh, so I'm hoping that when we dig deeper into CITES, uh, we'll find that we can use, uh, reuse the data model, add the specialization that's specific to exchange of endangered species material or, or, or trade in um, uh, products, uh, and, and then reuse the uh, uh, certificate of origin style decentralized architecture for issuing and verification of certificates. And on top of that, CITES has to manage quotas and acquittals, which adds another layer of complexity, but also quite manageable, I think. So uh, in my one minute left, I just want to summarize the, I suppose, the two key takeaways that I, I want to present to you. One of which is um, to achieve faster uptake of electronic facilitation. Let's use simple data structures, such as the UNC fact um, um, uh, certificate model. But whenever you use it in a particular domain, uh, it will need semantic specializations like the good work IPPC has done. Uh, uh, and that's important to make sure that uh, countries can interoperate and there's no confusion about what you mean about the quality claim. Uh, and the other one takeaway is what we learned from um, uh, certificates of origin is that um, using a more decentralized model for the actual exchange of the certificate, this is not, not changing at all the semantic content or the structure, whether you exchange a certificate in a G2G XML channel or whether you load it to a hub or whether you issue it as a verifiable credential, it's the same certificate. Uh, but using a verifiable credential model, a decentralized model, I think uh, massively facilitates rapid uptake because you decouple dependencies between uh, issuer and verifier. Uh, so, and I think that'll be important with uh, CITES uh, and other uh, more complex um, um, uh, permit and certificate structures. Uh, so that's it. I think I hit my 10 minutes. Uh, my countdown timer says I've got 20 seconds left. Um, so uh, Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, now, without further ado, I, I would like to go back to Lisa once again. Uh, so, John Yan, if you could share. Thank you, Chair. It's a great honor to participate in this webinar. I'd like to take this opportunity to give a brief introduction to the recent developments of agricultural trade for facilitation in China. First of all, let's look at China's agricultural trade development. Since its accession to the WTO in 2001, China has faithfully fulfilled its WTO accession commitments and opened its market to the world. China's simple average MFN bond rate is 15.2 for agricultural products, which accounts for one quarter of the global average. In addition, China has unilaterally reduced MFN applied tariffs on a wide range of agricultural products to further open the market. In the past two decades, China's agricultural trade, especially import, has expanded rapidly. China is now the world's largest importer of agricultural products. Among the key elements which contribute to the increase of China's agricultural imports, trade facilitation measures occupy a special place. In recent years, China has launched a series of trade facilitation measures. Although some of the measures are not targeted at agricultural products, they are still critical for agricultural trade, given that the agricultural products are highly sensitive to delays. Tactical measures include the following. Number one, special treatment for perishable goods. China Customs gives priority to perishable goods 
when scheduling any inspection that may be required. Importers could make an appointment for inspection before the arrival of the perishable goods, and the goods will be examined upon their arrival. Almost all customs offices in China have set up special window or green channel for perishable goods, which is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, offering excellent customs clearance services for perishable goods. Number two, implementation of admission supervision by phases. China Customs has started a pilot for a new supervision model for imports. In this new model, the supervision process is divided into two phases. Phase one, admission for entry. Imported goods may be approved for pickup and departure from the entry port of customs supervision zone before laboratory inspection is finished, on the condition that the importer promises not to sell or use the goods before obtaining permission from the customs. Phase two, admission for sale or use. Imported goods could enter the market once the customs confirms that the goods have passed the inspection and the relevant procedures have been finished. This mode further optimizes the allocation of customs supervision resources, facilitates the customs clearance process, and shortens the time goods spent in customs. Number three, direct pickup by vessel side. Tianjin ports have promoted the mode of direct pickup by vessel side for imported goods. Importers could make advance declaration and make full use of the transit time of goods to go through customs clearance procedures. When the goods arrive at the port, they will be classified and the goods that do not need to be inspected can be directly picked up. Importers could handle the relevant payment procedures, make appointment for pickup, keep track of the unloading process, and estimated pickup time through a mobile application and pick up the goods as soon as possible. Number four, electronic application and issuance of SPS certificate. From August the 1st, 2020, importers could apply for the electronic SPS certificate through China International Trade Dingo Window by typing in their mobile phone number. Once the customer finishes the inspection and quarantine process, an electronic message showing the certificate number and query code is sent to the applicants. The certificate could be downloaded through the single window. Well, that concludes my presentation today. I hope that you may find the trade facilitation measures taken in China useful to prepare your own measures. Thank you for your attention. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Ma, once again. So now we will be moving to our uh, uh, last uh, speaker, last but not least, uh, Mr. Cesare Barallo. He's the founder of GoodLawLatest.com. Cesare. Thank you. Thank you for having me today.
I'll share my slides directly. And uh, here we are. Thank you for this invitation. Just a couple of words uh, about me. Food, food Law Latest is a food law blog where you can find a lot of information about food law and trade. But I'm also a lawyer dealing 100% uh, of my time with the regulatory issue issues. I am I've also, you know, some teaching courses about SPS measures, WTO stuff around the world. So I know a couple of things. I would like to move briefly the perspective to Italy, my country, and to the side of the companies, as briefly mentioned in the introduction for Ireland, to let you understand the problems and what best practices might might help my, my clients. Because in my day-to-day -day job, you know, when I receive requests from my client, you know, my life is made of phone calls of people that tells me, oh, I'm a small medium enterprise. Tomorrow I have to ship my goods to Cambodia or Peru or Canada or Australia or whatever. What are the SPS requirements? What are the problems with pesticides? What are the problems with contaminants? We have different measures about food contact materials, you know, and whatever. And the small companies are completely uh, lost in, in that. So we need to find a way to give effective guidance to uh, especially those players because big corporations are different. They have not the full knowledge as well because the world is uh, becoming complex and complex and more complex every day when it comes to food regulation, but at least they have uh, long term plans. They, they plan differently, but SMEs, small medium enterprise that uh, need to be quick, fast, need to have uh, uh, affordable also services or accessible information to manage their business. Italy is a good example to speak about because we exported last year 46.1 billion euro uh, in food. That's a huge number and uh, it's uh, our, our personal record, let's say. Just two or three years ago, we were exporting around 30 billion. So that's a huge improvement. On an overall, more or less, it depends how you calculate uh, the, the, the value, uh, 132 billions. So uh, it's, uh, let's say, roughly a third of our um, of the value of our food production is, is exported. So export is becoming more and more interesting for, for us because, of course, Made in Italy is well known around the world for its quality and, uh, and we are well known for have a certain degree of knowledge in processing food. Um, but also because the internal market honestly is a bit weak, we don't have so much demand, is not paying very, very well like other markets. So our companies are exporting a lot. We have around 70,000 food businesses and most of them, more than 95%, like uh, in Europe, by the way, are so-called small medium enterprises. So. Uh, the average size might be, okay, not really, you know, the small farm uh, run by, you know, uh, a single family, but let's say a few million euro of turnovers, not billions or hundreds of millions like, you know, being US corporations where the, the size is, is much bigger. So the problems are when you export that again, you, what? Well, to be honest, the first point is that still you don't have much countries that go digital with the certificates. On the contrary, still in Europe we are doing step forward, but we 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 add the different um, common entry documents for different goods coming from Europe from different countries, no, and not everything has been fully digitalized. We are on this route, but uh, there are countries that are doing, uh, I guess better and when it comes to certificate of analysis veterinary certificates phytosanitary certificates mm, there is not very much that is uh, digital when it comes to export my best resource in italy is a veterinarian working in a public office in the competent authorities with a usb uh, memory uh, gathering uh, thousands of uh, those certificates that he gather in his daily practice uh, you know uh, uh, in years. We don't have uh, a very um, accessible database for companies and sometimes also our authorities are lost when you ask them guidance about how to export to a, f uh, to a country. Let's say that you know that for your commodity a certain market is open, maybe in the Far East, okay? You go to your local uh, authorities or to the customer and you say, well, 
I would really like to explore there. Can, can you give me some hints about what I have to do, which kind of certificate I have to fill? And sometimes they have no idea because they themselves don't have all the time the training and the material and the vision on all the certificates and the agreements that we have. So we need to build channels to, uh, to, to gather those information and, and make them available. We have some help desks for exporters that are very active in Italy. We have an agency called ICE in Italian, but ITA is more easy as an acronym, Italian Trade Investment Agency. Okay. It is working under our ministries of, of economic development and, um, and it is very useful. Fill reports like the USDA, for instance, in, in the United States, uh, giving you an idea, uh, a very general idea of the requirement of each country, and sometimes giving you also access to certain certificates that you need to export. But the focus is mostly on finding you commercial uh, channels, commercial agents, importers, uh, uh, investment opportunities. They support. Uh, trade expos, fairies and trade shows so with, with incentives. So they help you to go, let's say, to fancy food in New York or to trade expos in China. But when it, when it comes to regulatory issues at SPS, they are a bit weak. The same goes for the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they have good intentions, guidances, especially my office in Torino is very active but they cannot give a full picture. And the same goes for the trade associations. They do uh, what they can, but they are not huge organizations with thousands of people that can monitor the requirements uh, across all uh, the world. So they are not reaching the necessary level of details to, to help you uh, completely very effectively. Two best practices that I found in my markets, very interesting, you have the link here. Uh, Accredia, the Italian accreditation body, as a list of accredited laboratories and testing methods for sanitary and phytosanitary testing. So if you need to, let's say, test for aflatoxins, you go there, you find the list of laboratories that can release a certificate that is suitable for export to certain market. And um, the other one, more interesting for me, it's that a certain local sanitary authorities called us, so the local offices of our controlling authority, that is basically the Ministry of Health when it comes to food and safety, are creating export task forces where people like my friend, the veterinarian with the USB key and uh, 40,000 certificates on it, are creating task forces to specifically help the companies to export because we are finally getting the value of uh, uh, what we are producing here and the value of the export for the Italian economy. So these public officials are putting in place uh, this task force made of specialized uh, vets uh, or officials with different backgrounds uh, that uh, are dealing with trade barriers, but not on the political side. Let's say we try to negotiate with the authorities of other countries, you know, a protocol, uh, a certificate, something, but helping the companies, that's the most important part to me. Uh, they create a virtual help desk, so an online help desk where they are now uh, uploading, you know, all the material. And we hope that will be a useful tool for the future because we, again, we we have nothing, uh, we have nothing in this sense, and it's a pity because, uh, of course, I'm a consultant. I could say, well, it's a business opportunity for me, but not all companies can, you know, ask a consultancy for each single operation that they do. Uh, some IT companies are trying to building databases that gather all the SPS and regulatory requirements of all countries around the world, but those are tools that again are very, very costly, might cost several hundred, uh, hundred sorry, ten thousands of euro per year to be managed, so they can be afforded maybe by Nestlé, Danone, I don't know, but not for sure by SMEs and small companies. That is all from my side, and I thank you very much for the invitation again. Thank you very much, Cesare. Um, I am regrettably to say uh, we are running out of the time and because we have to move on to the next session, uh, we would not have the Q&A uh, session.
However, I have seen that there were some questions which was answered by the experts. And please, for the, all the participants, please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have any further questions regarding the presentations made today. Um, I would also like to uh, say that all the presentation would be uploaded as uh, specified in the chat on the event page. So um, please check and then um, thank you so much for joining us for this session uh, one on agricultural trade facilitation. The next session, which is on uh, trade facilitation for SMEs, will be starting in 13 minutes. So thank you very much to all the panelists as well as the participants. Have a good day and we will see you in 13 minutes again. Thank you. Thank you.